AP Literature friends, Christian Kuhn coming at you, affectionately known as the Bob Ross of Composition. And we got an interesting one today. We are going to tackle our octopus friend. Probably one of the most intriguing prompts ever on an AP Literature exam. So it was from FRQ2 2022 People of the Whale. So this is a student facing writing workshop. So I'll be talking to students and what I'm gonna do is stick to status quo. I'm going to get to my blank canvas, my easel, and I'm going to paint the entire essay for you while wielding my heuristics of the declarative, the inverted thesis heuristic, and the syllogistic method will house our body paragraphs. So without further ado, let's get some business out of the way. Please subscribe to my channel if you haven't already. Christian Kuhn, the Bob Ross at Composition and spread the good word far and wide. One of the things I'm gonna be doing is making videos from 2015 all the way to the present moment, spotlighting each FRQ, all three of them for Lang and Lit. So for over two decades, I've been an AP Lang and AP Lit teacher, so I have a good firm hold on this. And I think my heuristics are pretty cool in terms of demystifying the writing process, especially when we take a Bob Ross approach to our teaching. So without further ado, let's look at this crazy prompt and see what is going on. So the following excerpt is from Linda Hogan's novel, People of the Whale, published in 2008. In this passage, the narrator describes two events that occur in a community. An infant's birth shortly followed by an octopus's walking out of the sea. Read the passage carefully, then in a well-written essay, analyze how the author uses literary elements and techniques to develop a complex characterization of the community. So I train my students to read prompts. You can go, you know, lit term hunting in these prompts. And one of the things that I see immediately is that there's probably going to be a juxtaposition in this excerpt, right? So when they talk about the two events, those are going to be juxtaposed. You also know that you got to focus on the characterization of the community. And by extension of that, you probably are going to have to touch upon setting. So immediately my antennae are up for exactly what I need to focus on in this. And then, you know, one antennae needs to be up for uh, the other uh, lit terms, devices, techniques as well. All right absolute blank canvas. We're looking at a blank sheet of paper. Teachers assign this blank computer screen, whatever your modality is. We got to ask ourselves the question, so how do I write the intro? And before I tell you the magic to that, the magic secret, I got to tell you about Bob Ross in my instruction and what I mean by that. Bob Ross used a heuristic called the wet on wet technique every single time he approached a net painting a natural landscape. And every time I engage in expository writing, whether it be literary analysis, rhetorical analysis, argument, persuasion, synthesis, even research, I use the same heuristics because it completely demystifies the process. And having a uniform approach just enables me and students to instinctually sort of habitually know what to do when we write, because oftentimes teachers will give you an essay. And even though you're juniors or seniors, you're like, dude, I've never written an essay before. What do I do? What do I do? And it's this guessing game, this radical guessing game of what does teacher want? That should never happen, right? So what I'm going to do is get to the easel, get to the canvas, and I'm going to paint with and for you so that you know full well by the end of this video how to approach doing this particular FRQ, all right? Not just for this essay, but all FRQs, right? Because I want you to rock the heck out of this exam. So with that said, I'm going to give you some top secret information that I may get arrested for, and that's okay. No, I'm joking. I won't get arrested, but this is a, like some really cool breaking news and some top secret information. Implicit in FRQ1 and FRQ2 prompts, so both, both essays, FRQ1 and FRQ2, implicit in the prompt are two questions. What is the author's intent and how does the author construct meaning? If first you got to read and ascertain the meaning of the text correctly, if you do that and then you answer both of these questions, 
in the introductory paragraph, you are a slam dunk certainty to get the thesis point. All right, promise you that. So this is what my students do. Paragraphs, if you're familiar with my work, in introductory paragraphs are always four sentences when you're using my heuristics. And for literary analysis, so we're doing AP literature, so we're doing literary analysis, my students always uniformly uh, uh, approach the introduction with the inverted thesis heuristic, all right? And given that it's four sentences, let's break down the math. They're gonna take three sentences and they're gonna lead with these three sentences and answer the question, what is the author's intent? Your teachers might talk about universal th theme, universal truth, exigence, however they cloak it and word it, it doesn't matter. I call it authorial intent. The fourth sentence is going to be the thesis statement, because whenever you answer the question, how does the author construct meaning, that constitutes the thesis. So you got to use your terms, your devices, techniques to answer that question. And my students usually focus like on three of the most salient, germane, relevant, pertinent terms and drop it so that you're not you're not like coming up with a literary terms, you know, dump truck and just dropping like six or seven. I've seen students do that before, and it's not the most artful thing. So let's look at this kind of graphically in terms of what needs to go into the introductory paragraph. So as I said, we're going to invert. We're going to end with the thesis. So the first three sentences are going to be our context, background, universal truth, right? What is the author's intent? And then the last sentence, we're answering how does the author construct meaning? But there's a couple of other things that I want you to focus on. One is your tier two level vocabulary. I want you to cop an academic tone because it is an academic audience that we're writing for. So by tier two, I'm suggesting SAT level caliber words. I run intensive word study academies with my students throughout the academic year. And over time, if they give me an iota of effort, uh, I see their vocabs augment exponentially. They really take off. So spend some time during the academic year just doing some word study strategies. And I got a few in my YouTube channel that you can use and incorporate, you know, in addition to what your teacher is doing with you. Sentence constructs are very special and very important. My students read a book called Write It Right by Strunk and White. And in Write It Right, there is something known as rule number 18. Rule number 18 espouses the idea that there's 12 different sentence types. So my students spend a lot of time learning at sentence level when and why and how to wield these types. They have a purpose. They have an intent. Now, there's also something else that goes a little deeper into allowing my students to be syntactical ninjas. There's 20 ways to pattern a sentence. So once you get the types and the patterns down, whoa, man, sky's the limit. You can do some pretty cool things because young, struggling, emerging students often over rely on independent clauses and short, simple declarative sentences, which yields that da 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 you know, like tone that you really don't want. And it precludes you from ever being in contention for the sophistication point. So to have good voice rhythm and flow, I want you to focus on the sentence constructs. And I'll do a little bit of teaching of that in this presentation. So let's recap here before we take a look at exemplar number one. Three plus one, three authorial intent, one construction of meaning. So here is exemplar number one. I will read it through and then I'll unpack it for you and tell you all the little minutia that goes into it. It is human tendency for the mind to impose causal order to that which cannot be explained. Given this, as can be seen historically in origin stories, mankind describes value and meaning to that which is inexplicable, whether it be explaining the essence of life, the cause of the universe, or even the how and the why of octopus behavior, man can invent some far-fetched stories. So I'm three sentences in, and that's the exigence. That's the universal truth, right? We're looking at an origin story here. It's an allegory. Linda Hogan allegorically comments upon this phenomenon through her representation of the community and its collective interpretation of their cave-dwelling resident. So you focus on the terms, the devices, the techniques at the end there. 
I think it's pretty difficult to write about this particular FRQ if you ain't focusing on the fact that it's an allegory. Now, I think this was probably one of the harder FRQ 2s that I've ever seen in 20 plus years of teaching uh, the course. And my students uh, did okay on this. So like I, I, I found like the kids that really worked with me over the course of the year and were attentive and did their assignments on time and put forth good effort, they crushed this exam. I, I thought it was fair, but this was kind of a curveball one uh, for students. And unfortunately, some of my students were unprepared for the rigors of this. You can see here up top that first sentence, I think encapsulates the whole essence of the piece right? That we, we kind of impose causal order on our reality, this cause and effect. I think that's what Hogan's ultimately getting at. I fleshed that out with two more sentences. Last sentence, I hit you with the terms, the devices, techniques. Again, you don't always need to explicitly state the term. I imply something in there as well. So my vocab is up. Good words like causal, impose, you don't want to totally geek out on this, but you know, stay in your wheelhouse, stay in your lane, sound natural, ascribes a good word, inexplicable. So words like that bode well in terms of putting you in contention for the sophistication point. So I have videos in my YouTube channel on the 20 sentence patterns. And one of the patterns is known as the trio in which you use the dash. So look at this sentence here beginning with whether it be. So I'll explain it to you. Whether it be explaining the essence of life, number one, the cause of the universe, number two, or even how and the why of octopus behavior, three. So it's called a trio. And do you see how I'm using double dashes there? So that's pattern number eight uh, in the uh, 20 sentence patterns. My students get into the habit of doing things like that. And, you know, when I read college board sample papers, most kids in the nation aren't doing that kind of stuff. But if you really want to be in contention for the sophistication point, your vocab's got to be up like this. And you got to be able to bust out some sentences like that in order to cop a certain voice rhythm and flow. And that's kind of the whole kit and caboodle there. Let's do it again because that might be confounding and some of you might be scratching your head saying, I can't do that. You can, it takes practice. Ever since the advent of time, man has sought to give voice to the ineffable qualities of nature. Again, I think that's the whole encapsulation. Cause then I was like, what's the essence of this? Why did Hogan write this? Like what's, what's the gist here? Why'd she even bother? Man is a meaning maker and when meaning cannot be made, he creates stories and ascribes value to things that are actually meaningless and rather innocuous. That's why history is dotted with false gods and false prophets. Fourth sentence, hit me with the terms, the devices, the techniques. Linda Hogan touches upon this fact through her allegorical rendering of the octopus and her characterization of human reasoning. So I got characterization and allegory. So I, earlier I said, you know, my students usually go with three. I think in this one, those, those are the two most important ones, characterization, allegory, and by extension of that setting. Uh, reasoning, you know, we, we, get, we get into some AP language sort of stuff here in terms of going back to logos, right? The thinking, of the dwellers is really important in terms of how they construct the meaning of their reality. So I'm kind of getting at that as well. In my body paragraphs, I actually do talk about logos a little bit. And this is one of the reasons why I thought this passage was a little tricky because, you know, most you know, at my school, kids take language, then they take lit. And you guys are like a year removed from taking language and you, like you forgot all about logos and reasoning and, you know, all that Aristotelian stuff. And it's like, nope, it oftentimes manifests itself in literature as well. It's not just a nonfiction device. So let's do that again, because yes, you can, you can do this. So let me dial it back and simplify it just a tad bit. Life, sadly, is meaningless. Look how simple that opening sentence is, right? Pretty cool. And again, universal truth. Ever since we pulled ourselves upright and began to do this thing called living, Mankind is sought to make sense of his world and its origins. As such, over this great expense of time, there have been countless gods, deities, and prophets, all of whom are meaningless. Fourth sentence, terms, devices, techniques, construction of meaning, three plus one. Hogan gives voice to this 
through her allegorical depiction of the octopus and through the characterization of the community that interact with it. So each time in that fourth sentence in all three exemplars, you know, you got to really focus on the construction of meaning in terms of the devices, the techniques, you know, the elements. And then first three sentences just get to the universal truthiness of the piece. Again, look at the sentence structures there. So that uh, third sentence is kind of crafty, right? That's one of the sentence patterns that my students use. Um, that even that first pattern, is, you know, is, is pattern number 17. Life, sadly, is meaningless. Life, comma, sadly, is meaningless, right? So get good voice rhythm and flow there through your syntactical manipulations. And uh, again, it puts you in further contention for the sophistication point. And I don't even really care about the sophistication point. Like one out of 870 kids gets it. It's kind of a phantom in many ways. But in terms of getting you ready for college and real world writing, you know, having these patterns and these sentence types under your belt is just going to bode really well for you. You're going to be a phenomenal writer once you master that. So because this is one of the trickiest prompts I've ever seen, let's see it again. And again, I'll just I'll hold back a little bit in case you're having some trouble. Man's most preeminent fear is that life is for naught. For centuries, great philosophical minds have wrangled with the big questions as to why we are here and who made us and what does it all add up to. Thousands of years later, we still do not have any definitive answers, yet we persist in trying to make sense of our world. Right. So each time, and I did it four times here, uh, those three sentences in all four, the, 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 the three leading sentences, are all pretty much expressing the same thing. I'm just saying it in different words, right? You have to read it correctly, all right? And this was a hard one to read. So last one, terms, devices, techniques, construction of meaning. Linda Hogan unpacks this human condition through her allegorical depiction of the octopus and the community's collective rationalizing of its behavior and existence. So I, I'm in logos again there, right? Characterization by extension, probably by extension setting. All right, my students, my beloved students, give it a whirl. Three plus one, try your hand at an introduction for this very intriguing piece. Show each other your work because I'm a firm believer that the more writing you see, the better you become. Teachers, if you're viewing, give it a whirl, man. Bob Ross, your instruction and show your kids how to do it. Still plenty of canvas left, right? We only have an intro done. We can't call it quits. That took yeoman's work to get through that intro, but... Still got a whole bunch of other stuff to do. Question becomes, so how do I write the bodies? And we're going to proceed syllogistically. So let me give you a quick synopsis of the syllogistic method. It comes from our main boy, Aristotle. He had a school called the Lyceum and the town's boys would go there to learn polemics, oration, debate, wordsmithing, word wrangling. And I don't know how much philosophical background you guys have, but my AP Lang students read a tad bit of Plato's Republic in which the essential question, what is justice, is thrown at them. They grapple with that. So all these philosophical think tankers step to the proverbial mic and they wrestle with what is justice. And Aristotle, like us composition teachers, is really principally concerned with line of reason and argumentation. And this is expository writing. We are arguing. So... He had a eureka moment one day and he said, I got it. My really gifted orators, like they use math in their thinking. They're like, you know, calculus majors. They, they, they have like this methodological approach, this calculative approach to their reasoning. And he called it the syllogistic method. And simply all it is, is when you move from premise, premise to conclusion. I'll give you an example. And I've been told that my example is morbid. So forgive me if it is. I'm not a morbid guy, but uh, it's just, just an example I came up with. First premise, if I were to say to you, arsenic is deadly, you'd nod your head and say, yep, Christian, you are right. If I follow it up with premise two and state my dog ate arsenic, you would probably think logically, uh-oh, Christian, that ain't boding well for your dog. Your dog's probably going to die. And Aristotle would call that a cogent argument. We call it line of reasoning in composition. 
And I'm gonna interchange those two uh, throughout the rest of my presentation. So how do we take the syllogistic method a la Aristotle and morph it into a heuristic to perform literary analysis. And you guys might say, hey man, this is the same heuristic that we used for FRQ1. Yup. And it's the same heuristic you'll use for FRQ3. Your body paragraphs for this exam can be written with one uniform approach. And that is the syllogistic method heuristic. First premise, we're going to take three sentences and drop an argument containing terms, devices, techniques. Note the S's on terms, devices, techniques. We are not going to do one paragraph tone, one paragraph syntax, one paragraph diction, right? That's too plotting, dutiful, and elementary. We're beyond that. So we're gonna multitask and begin to see how terms, devices, and techniques create meaning together, right? So we're gonna unify them and kind of jigsaw cram them together. So that takes three sentences because on FRQ1 on the AP Lit or AP Lang exam, the uh, synthesis paper, the college board says several times, your argument must be central. And I'm like, golly, geez, I wish the college board would say that for all six FRQs because we're doing expository writing and expository writing is an act of argumentation. To keep your argument central, you cannot be quoting or paraphrasing in sentences one, two, and three. You will break the demand of the assignment, switch expository modes, and you will be writing plot synopsis, plot analysis. And that's not going to, you know, you're not going to score well on, on, the, on the exam if you do that. So keep all your quotes, all your paraphrases for the fourth sentence. Just get anchored in your argument. So it's kind of a training wheel, sort of a scaffold, but it really works to keep the centrality of your argument. I'm going to model that for you in just a sec. Fourth sentence begins the second premise. We're going to put all of our textual support into the second premise in the forms of quoting and paraphrasing, and we are going to teeter-totter balance that out. Body paragraphs need to be concluded, so you just can't end on a quote or a paraphrase and run like heck and say, I'm done, woo, nope. You got to conclude it, textual analysis. Link back to the prompt, echo the thesis, keep the promise of the first premise. Students ask good questions because they're insightful learners and they say, Christian, how many sentences is this going to take? And I tell them 10 to 12. So I'm going to model the whole thing for you. Let's take a look at the first premise. Another good question that students ask is, where do I begin my analysis? And my immediate response to that is this. Start where the author starts. I'm not a big fan of templates because I think that we give you prefabricated verbiage and front load your thoughts too much for you. But I do use a sentence stem, you know, at, in the beginning of this process. And it's not even, it's not even a whole sentence, it's a sentence clause. Four words and a comma right from the onset. So if you're starting where the author starts, it's a good idea to indicate to your reader that you have a chronology that you're going to stay organized and that you absolutely are going to have a tight line of reasoning. So right from the onset, let your reader know like, hey, man, this kid's organized. I like this guy. He's got a, he's got a methodological approach that is going to be supremely tight. And I like that, too, when I'm reading students' papers. I don't like the wayward, willy-nilly, you know, discursive writing that I see. It's, uh, it's, it's not, not good writing. So note how I multitask here. Right from the onset, Hogan creates a causal relationship between the birth of the infant and inexplicable behavior of the octopus. So we got juxtaposition there. I implied it, right? You don't have to always explicitly state the term. In many ways, because of the manner in which the pronouns and conjunctions are manipulated, so that's syntax, the passage unfolds like a syllogistic argument progressing from if statements to then claims, right? So I'm back in logos with this. I'm doing AP language sort of stuff. So I'm in logos. The short, simple declarative sentences also highlight this quality. So I got a lot of syntax that I'm going to do. I got a juxtaposition right? And I got logos. If I break down the, the, the first premise into a promise, I'm saying, I promise you, dear reader, 
All right, check this out. You got to go quote hunting. You got to go textual support hunting. I promise you, dear reader, that I'm going to do all three of these things. And I'm going to give you quotes and or paraphrases for all three of the things that I promised you in the first premise. And that, my friends, is how you stay cogent and keep your line of reasoning intact. Keep the promise of the first premise. So I literally... After writing my first premise, I go get all my quotes and my paraphrases and I have them in the bank of my mind. And as I write, I just plug them into my uh, heuristic and off I go. So let me show you my second premise, beginning fourth sentence. And uh, I'll walk you through the whole thing. So you see here, just eyeballing this, I got sufficient quotes. I got some paraphrasing, lots of support, lots of analysis. It's going to take all 10 to 12 sentences, the whole body paragraph. So within the first two paragraphs, Hogan references it on several occasions and qualifies the meaning being ascribed to the octopus by the humans with as if statements. So I'm getting into the logos here, right? It's a syllogism that she's writing and we're writing syllogisms. Oh my goodness. For example, we are told that every one of these ocean people stood back, amazed to see it walk. The eye of it looking at them, each one seen as if each one were known in all their past, all their future. Now I got to analyze that quote, right? You just can't quote and run like heck. You got to analyze it. The it, and look at that. This is tight diction analysis when you tear apart quotes like this, the word level analysis. The it is the divine significance of the octopus, as well as the human tendency to deify nature when nature's chaos renders things ineffable. In this regard, the it is analogous to what humans have done for centuries in terms of divining their known through the likes of gods, prophets, and deities. Fact of the matter is that man does not know his origin, so he indulge in, indulges in as if thinking because he's afraid of its potent meaning. Given that much of life is inexplicable to the human mind, Hogan notes that mankind arbitrarily conflates cause and effect and does things like think it was a holy creature and its presence at the time of his birth granted to Thomas a special life. All right, let's talk about my quote transitions because this is, you know, it's pretty silky smooth. You know, the, the, there's nothing brusque or abrupt with the quote transitions. So I do something called the five word rule. If a student places a minimum of five words in front of the quote and keeps the quote relatively small, and then just look at this, you know, slide right here. I bracketed once, I think. Yep, just once. So you got to bracket sometimes in order to keep the quote conversational. That's true embedding when you do that. All right. So you can see here that all my quotes, all my paraphrases were germane to the promise of the first premise. So Aristotle would say, Christian Kuhn, you a good boy. You stayed cogent, right? And that's what we want in our writing. But I ain't done yet. I got, I got to get back to the thesis and I got to get back to the prompt. So let's conclude this thought. And conclusions usually just take one or two sentences. So look at, look at how I wrap this up. As existential as it may sound, the causal relationships in the passage and the syntactical arrangements make one thing clear. Most of the meaning humans ascribe to higher powers is meaningless and arbitrary. As Freud said, sometimes a cigar is just a cigar. Very cool. My friends, my students, if you're writing with me, if you're painting along with me, pause here. Try your hand at multitasking that first premise. Go quote hunting. Embed your quotes with the five word rule and slam a tagging conclusion on that body paragraph, all 10 to 12 sentences. Show each other your work, peer edit it, get some advice, get some feedback, have your teachers look over your shoulder, and all should be well. So we've got an intro and a body done. We have to ask ourselves this question. We can't possibly be done. What's next? What do I do next? Boom, you bust out another syllogism. So I'm at like the middle of the passage, of Hogan's passage. And there's still so many more terms, devices, techniques that I got to analyze. 
And, you know, I really got to unpack the allegory a little bit more. There's still a little bit more I could do with some of the syntactical features because she's a ninja with the syntax in this. So there's a lot going on. And then I could probably talk about that juxtaposition a little bit more, too. And then the big thing, I got to get to the characterization, right? Because that's in the prompt. So I got to make sure I do that, talk about the setting. So it's just going to be a four paragraph essay, intro, two bodies, conclusion. So students, I'm going to leave you to your own on this because otherwise you guys just mimic me too much. And I want you to do some original, authentic thinking on your own. So I gave you the terms of the devices, techniques that are left. You know, like you really got to do characterization and setting. So from the middle of the passage all the way to the end, focus on that. And then just sprinkle in the bit parts as well that are, are remaining um, in the piece. So try your hand at that all on your lonesomes. And again, pure edit. The more writing you see, the better you become. So share it with your friends, share it with your teachers. Now let's talk about wrapping the essay up. We got to throw a conclusion paragraph on this. And early in the year, I really want to explicitly state this. Early in the year, I use conclusion stems with my students. And I know some of you are new to my work, so it's cool to use some conclusion stems. Conclusion paragraphs are like the grand finale of a fireworks display. Like your hammer in universal truth, universal theme, exigence, the truthiness of the piece, right? So I like encapsulating stems, like simply said, evidentially, in no other words, when it's all said and done at the end of the day in a global sense. And I just take like three or four sentences to wrap everything up. And then I'm done and I'm out of there. So I think that's a pretty easy process. I'm not going to model it for you other than giving you the stems. I think you're all intelligent enough to figure that out. And uh, there's really no grand magic to that. You know, as you get more advanced and confident in your abilities, take the training wheels off, get rid of the scaffolds and lose the stems and be more authentic. All right, I'm signing out. Happy teaching, happy writing, peace be with you. If you want to send me an email for any reason, you haven't, you know, want to just reach out to me, drop me an email at teachingwritingcoach at gmail.com. Uh, I think some teachers and students are a little apprehensive to drop me an email, even though they want to. They're like, who's this guy? I always respond to emails. So drop me an email. I spend like an hour of my day responding to emails. I love it. I love the fact that People throughout the nation are using my heuristics. It's super cool. So I love that. That's This is why, why I do what I do. I also am a lead teacher for the National Writing Project. I present for NCTE. I may even be presenting for uh, uh, the college board in this summer's AP conference. We put in a proposal for that. So fingers crossed. Hopefully we can do that. I present for perfection learning off and on as well. So I have a website, www.teachinghowtowrite.com. And I have a calendar there of all of my professional development offerings. Some are for actually most are free. Some are for a nominal fee. And uh, you can see when our webinars are and our PD offerings. Students, I have a tutoring company called Write at Ivy Write. I'm an Ivy League graduate, undergrad and graduate degrees. And I'm really expert on college personal statements. So as you think about applying to college and you want to crush a personal statement in your supplements, drop me an email and we can talk shop. Also, if you want a one-on-one -on -one tutoring, I also do group tutoring for districts as well. Uh, if you really want to crush your AP exams, Langer Lit, been teaching this stuff for over two decades. I got a firm hold on it and uh, be happy to help you get in position to really rock a good score on either Lang or Lit. All right, that's it from here, folks. I'll see you in the next writing workshop. The end.